This is the first video talking about Aegon's conquest. If you want a prequel about the Targaryens landing on Dragonstone and what happened to their people, the Valerians, watch our Aegon prequel. So before I get into Aegon's conquest, I want to talk a little bit about Aegon and his sister wives Visenya and Rhaenys to add better context to the story. Visenya was the eldest of three siblings. She had silver gold hair, purple eyes, and a harsh, severe beauty. Visenya was stern, serious, unforgiving, even to those closest to her, and allegedly played with poisons and the dark arts. She was a skilled warrior, comfortable in both ringmail and silk, and trained with her brother since childhood. She wielded Dark Sister, a Valerian longsword, and had the dragon Vagar. Rhaenys was the youngest of the siblings. She was playful, curious, impulsive, not really a warrior, and loved music, dancing, and poetry. Rhaenys loved flying and spent more time on her dragon than both her brother and sister combined. And while Visenya's fidelity to her brother husband was never questioned, Rhaenys really liked handsome men and often surrounded herself with them. And if the rumors are true, she even invited some of them to her bedchambers. However, for every one night Aegon spent with Visenya, he spent ten with Rhaenys. Rhaenys had the dragon, Moraxis. Aegon was a bit of a mystery to most. He was a great warrior, wielding the Valerian sword Blackfire, but he didn't ride in any tourneys or melees and disliked feats of arms. He only used his dragon, Valerian the Black Dread, to fight in battle or get somewhere quickly. His presence drew men to his side, but he had no close friends save Oris Baratheon. He was always faithful to his sister wives, despite women being drawn to him. And as king, he put trust in others, such as his sisters and small council, to run his day-to-day -day affairs of the realm, though he was always ready to take command when needed. He was open-handed and merciful to former enemies that bent the knee, but dealt harshly with rebels and traitors. So with that little bit of background about Aegon and his sisters, let's begin to talk of the conquest. Aegon the Conqueror had just finished fighting in Essos to put down Volantis, and now he began to turn his eyes to Westeros. Aegon had been interested in Westeros long before he set sail to conquer it. Aegon and his sister Visenya had visited the citadel of Old Town in their youth and the arbor as a guest of Lord Redwine. Some even claimed Aegon had visited Lannisport. Years before Aegon sailed to conquer Westeros, he had a huge slab of wood, 50 feet long, carved into the shape of Westeros and painted to show all the woods, rivers, towns, and castles of the Seven Kingdoms. Aegon knew that Westeros was divided into Seven Kingdoms, with two or three of them constantly at war with each other. Torrhen Stark ruled in the north, Ronald Arryn, a young boy whose mother, Shara Arryn, ruled as regent, in the Vale, Fingers, and the Mountains of the Moon, Heron the Black in the Riverlands, Lorne Lannister in the Westerlands, Myrne Gardener in the Reach, Argalac Dorodon, also known as Argalac the Arrogant in the Stormlands, and Maria Martell, Princess of Dorne, a blind, balding woman of 80 known as the Yellow Toad. Of the Seven Realms, two realms that were closest to Dragonstone caused the most problems, Heron the Black in the Riverlands and Argalac the Arrogant in the Stormlands. House Dorodon had once ruled the eastern half of Westeros, from Cape Roth to the Bay of Crabs, but their power had been fading for some time. The kings of the Reach kept taking more and more of their territory from the north. Dorne kept pushing from the south into their land, and Heron the Black pushed inwards into the Stormlands, from the Trident and the lands north of the Blackwater. Heron the Black of the Riverlands was also known for his cruelty, and it was legendary throughout the Seven Kingdom. Heron's father had taken the Trident from Argalac's father, and Heron himself spent most his reign, about 40 years, building an enormous castle named Harrenhal by the god's eye. However, the castle was almost complete, and Heron the Black's eyes were turning to other conquests. Because of this, Argalac the Arrogant, the Storm King, an aging warrior with only a maiden daughter as his heir, started to feel incredibly threatened by Heron the Black, and perhaps this fear is is what made Argalac send a proposition to Aegon. If Aegon would marry his maiden daughter, Argalac would give him all the lands east of the God's Eye, from the Trident to the Blackwater Rush. Aegon, however, loved his two wives and declined Argalac's offer, saying he had two wives and had no need for a third. The other problem with Argalac's offer was the lands he proposed to give to Aegon weren't Argalac's to give. They belonged to Harrenhal. It was clear to Aegon that Argalac wanted to use Aegon as a buffer between Argalac's lands and Harren the Blacks. Aegon instead offered the hand of his best friend, Oris Baratheon, who was also rumored to be Aegon's bastard brother, with the agreement Argalac would also give him Massey's Hook and the woods plains from the Blackwater South to the River Wenwater and the headwaters of the Mander. And Argalac was not happy about that offer and declared his daughter would not be married to a bastard. So Argalac cut off the hands of the envoy and had them sent to Aegon in a box, writing, These are the only hands your bastard shall have of me. 
Aegon didn't bother to reply, but instead gathered his allies, bannermen, and friends to Dragonstone. These included the Valarians of Driftmark and the Celticars of Claw Isle. Aegon also spoke with Lord Edmund of Sharp Point and Lord Massey of Stone Dance, both who were sworn to Storm's End, but had closer ties with Dragonstone. Later, Aegon would take counsel with his sisters and visited the castle sept to pray to the Seven of Westeros, even though he wasn't a particularly pious man. Seven days later, Aegon sent ravens to the Seven Kingdoms, lords both great and small, delivering a message. From this day forth, there would be but one king in Westeros. Those who bent the knee to Aegon of House Targaryen would keep their lands and titles. Those who took up arms against him would be thrown down, humbled, and destroyed. Aegon set sail from Dragonstone with his sisters and a small army, some say 3,000, some say it only numbered in the hundreds, and landed on the mouth of the Blackwater Rush. The river was claimed by both Storm's End and Harrenhal, but the mouth of the river was undefended and the closest castles held by lesser lords that had little love for their liege lords. Aegon sent his sisters to the nearest castles to get their submission. Rhaenys and her dragon made Rasby yield without a fight. Visenya with her dragon, Vagar, went to Stokeworth, where a few bolts were fired at her, but they also quickly submitted when Visenya had Vagar set the castle keep roofs on fire. At this time, Lord Darklyn of Deskendale and Lord Moonton of Maidenpool, along with 3,000 of their men, joined together to march on Aegon and his men. Aegon sent Oris Baratheon to attack them on the march, and Aegon came at them from above on his dragon, the Black Dread. Both Lord Mouton and Lord Darklyn were killed in the battle quickly, and Darklyn's son and Mouton's brother yielded up their castle and swore themselves to Aegon. Duskendale at the time was a major port on the Narrow Sea and was very wealthy from trade. Because of the town's wealth, Visenya chose not to sack Duskendale, but claimed its riches and increased the Targaryen's coffers. After these victories, Aegon would go on to take near a dozen more castles on either side of the Blackwater Rush, secure the mouth of the river, and build Aegon Fort, a crude, wooden earth castle on the newly named Aegon's High Hill. Aegon Fort was built where present-day King's Landing and the Red Keep are. Here, Aegon assured people that those that knelt to him would be raised up and confirmed in their lands and titles. Here, Aegon also rewarded his allies. Tristan Massey, Lord of Stone Dance, was named Master of Laws. Crispin Celtigar was named Master of Coin. Damon Valarian, Lord of the Tides, was named Master of Ships and in command of the Royal Fleet. And Oris Baratheon was made the first King's Hand. Here in Aegon Fort, Aegon displayed a great silk battle standard with a red three-headed dragon breathing fire on a black field. Although banners were a tradition for the Lords of Westeros, they had never been used by the Dragon Lords of Valeria. When Aegon displayed his banner, the lords took it as a sign Aegon was now one of them and a worthy king for Westeros. Visenya then placed a Valerian steel circlet studded with rubies on Aegon's head, and Rhaenys hailed him Aegon, first of his name, king of all Westeros, and shield of his people. The dragons roared, lords and knights cheered, but the small folk were said to shout loudest of them all. Aegon, his army, and his crowning did not sit well with the seven rulers of Westeros. Heron the Black and Argilac the Arrogant had already called their bannermen. King Myrna of the Reach rode out to meet King Lorne of House Lannister, and in the north, King Torn Stark discussed with his Lord Bannermen and counselors late into the night. However, two of the rulers sent offers of alliance. First, the Princess of Dorne sent a raven to Dragonstone, offering to join Aegon against Argilac the Arrogant, but as an equal and an ally, not a subject. Second, Ronald Aaron, the boy king, offered to join Aegon against Hair in the Black, but only if they get all the lands east of the Green Fork of the Trident. Aegon didn't seem to respond, but days after his coronation, he began to march again. The greater part of his army was under the command of Oris Baratheon and joined by Rhaenys on a dragon, and they crossed the Blackwater Rush to head south to Storm's End. Aegon's fleet, commanded by Daemon Velaryon and joined by Visenya on her dragon, went north to Gulltown in the Vale. Aegon himself went northeast to the God's Eye in Harrenhal, the giant fortress Heron the Black had finally completed on the very day Aegon landed on the Blackwater Rush. These first battles didn't go so well, but they were only minor setbacks. Argilac's bannermen surprise attacked Oris Baratheon and his men as they crossed the Wind Water, killing more than a thousand men before falling back into the trees. The Targaryen fleet was attacked by an Aaron fleet, augmented with a dozen Bravosi warships off of Gulltown killing Daemon Valarian, master of ships, in the attack. Aegon was attacked twice while heading to the south shore of the God's Eye. However, the Battle of Reeds was a victory for Aegon, but he suffered heavy losses when two of Heron the Black's sons crossed the lake in longboats and fell on the rear of Aegon's men. But again, these were only minor setbacks. Aegon and his sisters had dragons, and no one in Westeros had developed a defense to keep them out. 
Argalek the Arrogance Bannerman hid in the trees after the surprise attack, until Rhaenys burned the woods down. When Aaron's fleet sunk a third of the Targaryen ships, the Senya answered by taking her dragon and burning the Aaron fleet. And Aegon took the Black Dread up into the sky and burned Heron's men, including his sons, as their boats went back to Harrenhal. Unfortunately for these lords, Aegon's beatdown didn't really stop there and their troubles continued. The lords' defeat led to others taking advantage of the situation. Argilac found pirates from the Stepstones attacking his shores on Cape Roth and Dornish raiding parties coming out of the Red Mountains to attack across the marshes. In the Vale, a rebellion started on the Three Sisters, when the sister men renounced their allegiance to Ronal Aaron and the Eyrie, instead naming Lord Marla Sunderland their queen. However, Heron the Black dealt with the worse. His desire to build the enormous Heron Hall had caused thousands to die in the Riverlands, while he took materials and gold from the small folk and lords. Despite Heron ruling them for three generations, with Aegon's advance, the River Lords finally decided they had enough of Heron, an ironborn man. When Heron called his bannermen to come defend Harrenhal, Lord Edmund Tully instead led River Lords against him. Raising the Targaryen banner over his castle, Edmund Tully inspired the other River Lords and they rode to join Aegon. One by one, the Lords of the Trident, including the Blackwoods, Malisters, Vances, Brackens, Pipers, Freys, and Strongs, turned on Heron and pledged loyalty to Aegon and attacked Harrenhal. Heron, knowing he was outnumbered, hid in his stronghold, considered the strongest castle in Westeros. Harrenhal had five huge towers, a constant fresh water supply, well-stocked provisions, and massive walls of blackstone higher than any ladder and too thick to be broken with a ram or siege engines. Heron waited in his castle, sure no one could successfully take it, and waited. And then we remember dragons! Aegon I, already joined by the river lords outside Harrenhal, sent a maester to the gates under a peace banner to parley. Heron emerged from his castle to speak with Aegon, and the exchange is pretty awesome. Aegon began, Yield now, and you may remain as Lord of the Iron Islands. Yield now, and your sons will live to rule after you. I have 8,000 men outside your walls. Heron replied, What is outside my walls is of no concern to me. Those walls are strong and thick, but not so high as to keep out dragons. Dragons fly. Heron countered, I built in stone. Stone does not burn. To which Aegon said, when the sun sets, your line shall end. Heron spat at Aegon and returned to his castle. Heron had every man armed with a spear, bow, or crossbow on the castle walls, ready to kill any dragon that tried to descend on the castle. Heron promised riches and lands to anyone that brought the dragon down. He even promised the river lords turned traitors' daughters to the dragon slayer. He told his men, had I a daughter, the dragon slayer would claim her hand as well. Instead, I will give him one of the Tully's daughters, or all three if he likes or he may pick one of the Blackwood's whelps, or Strong's, or any girl born of the traitors of the Trident, these lords of yellow mud. When the sun set, Aegon, true to his word, took his dragon up high in the clouds, then he descended on the castle, and as the great towers of Harrenhal appeared, the Black Dread bathed the castle in fire. Harrenhal's stones didn't burn, though some of the stones started to melt when the fire got hot enough, but the hemp, straw, bread, beef, grain, wool, and wood did. Hair and the Black's armored men roasted in their armor as they screamed and ran. The river lords outside the castle walls would later say the towers of Harrenhal glowed red against the night. Heron and his last sons died in the fires along with his bloodline, and the Iron Island's hold on the Riverlands ended that day. The next day, Edmund Tully swore an oath of fealty to Aegon and became the Lord Paramount of the Trident. The rest of the river lords swore oaths to both Aegon and Lord Tully, and when the castle cooled down, Aegon ordered the men to collect the swords of the dead, many shattered or melted or twisted into ribbons of steel, and had them sent back to Aegon Fort. Meanwhile, back at the Stormlands, Argilac gathered his much more loyal bannermen at Storm's End. Argilac soon heard about the death of Heron and about Rhaenys and her dragon. Argilac declared he wouldn't die in his own castle, and rode forth to meet Oris Baratheon. Rhaenys, and their army in person. But Rhaenys mounted her dragon and witnessed Argilac leaving his castle and reported back to Oris Baratheon, letting him know Argilac's exact numbers. Oris Baratheon went into position on the hill south of Bronze Gate, dug in, and waited for Argilac and his men. As Argilac and his men approached, it began to rain, and then the howling gale began by midday. Argilac's bannermen advised him to wait to attack till the next day when the storm had passed, but Argilac knew he outnumbered Oris Baratheon and his men by two to one, and he had four times as many knights and heavy horse. 
The rains blew south into the faces of the Targaryen men, and Argilac ordered an attack, a battle that would be known as the Last Storm. First, Argilac tried to get his knights and warhorses up the hills, but they failed all three times as the rain had turned the ground soft and muddy. Realizing his plan wasn't going to work, Argilac instead sent his spearmen up the hills on foot. The rain blinded Ors Baratheon and his men, and they didn't see the spearmen's approach until it was too late. All three hills fell to Argilac, and then Argilac led a final charge through the Baratheon army center, only to come face to face with Rhaenys and her dragon. Rhaenys had her dragon breathe fire on the men, and it began to consume them including Argilac's personal guard and his vanguard commanders. The warhorses fled and Argilac was thrown from his saddle. Argilac still fought and when Oris Baratheon found him, Argilac was fighting a dozen men with corpses at his feet. Oris commanded the men to stand down and met Argilac, giving him one more chance to surrender. Argilac, of course, refused and Oris and him began single combat. Finally, after wounding each other, Oris dealt the final blow, killing Argilac and taking all the fight out of the rest of the Stormlanders as they fled. Argilac's only heir, his daughter Argella, barred the gates to Storm's End and declared herself Storm Queen, as Oris Baratheon and his men approached the gates. Rhaenys with her dragon flew inside the castle to parley with Argella, but the Storm Queen responded, You may take my castle, but you will win only bones and blood and ashes. Gella's men had a different idea though, and that night they raised the peace banner opened the castle gates, and delivered Argella gagged, chained, and naked to the camp of Oris Baratheon. Oris wrapped his cloak around her and poured her wine, and spoke to her of her father's courage and the manner of his death. To honor the fallen king, Oris took the words and arms of Argilac's house. The crowned stag became Oris's sigil, and Storm's End his seat, and Lady Argella his wife. Come back next week to see the other rulers of Westeros freak out and Aegon take them out one by one, or come back Wednesday for another random light Game of Thrones video.